everyone, the name is Eric Thor and I'm here to talk to you today about postmodernism and the problem with postmodernism. And to understand that we must know what postmodernism is. And first I want to say one thing, postmodernism is characterized by this kind of massive skepticism, this doubt, th these questions towards science, reason, intellect, society, gender, <laughs> all things we have built throughout the last thousands of years. Postmodernism emerges as a kind of critique against all that we have made, everything we are, everything we do. It's kind of a, why do we do it? It's kind of a, what is the point of it? And it's very much centered on this idea of power and the pursuit of power. Postmodernists center around the study of power and power structure, almost to the point where a lot of postmodernists will argue that everything is explained by the question of power. Everything in the world centers around this one concept, power, and the distribution of power, and people's desire to have power. And these ideas are found in one of the three core spreads of psychology, First, we had Carl Jung that spread the idea that everyone is different and that that is a good thing. Then there is Sigmund Freud that spread the idea of psychoanalysis. And then there is a third psychologist often forgotten, Alfred Adler, and his idea that we are all kind of driven towards one core thing, and that is the feeling of being superior or of being powerful. Postmodernists come from this very idea that we are all searching for power and that everything we do is a reflection of that. And in this there is a kind of pessimism spread throughout postmodernists. A pessimism that states that we cannot agree with one another, we cannot understand each other's, we cannot reason with each other's, democracy doesn't work, discussion doesn't work, debate does not work, there Language, our language, our very language in itself is oppressive and its nature is to control us. The fact that we participate in and use language and use the established terminology and participate in these games is the reason these games exist. And the, here you find the kind of root of po postmodernism, the very, very essence of why it exists. It exists as this kind of frustration towards your situation and your position in society. Yes, there is this experience among postmodernists that people have been fighting for hundreds of years as women to rise up against sexism, yet sexism is still here. That there is this struggle around a lot of black people that have fought against racism for such a long time, yet racism is still here. This pessimism that you can't win, it's a battle you can't win, the system is rigged, everything is rigged against you. No matter how much you fight, no matter how much you study, you can't overcome these chains, you can't win. A black person can't become president, Oprah Winfrey can't become president, you know, there's this idea. And uh, no matter what happens, uh, there is a pessimism at the root of postmodernism, a pessimism uh, in which people are generally critical of the idea of change. Even if a black president wins, he will win only by emulating white people and white structures and only by supporting these white structures and he will not be able to change anything. The game will go on and the structures will keep on and everything will be the same. So here is the root of a lot of our conflict in the 21st century. Uh, the conflict between the sexes, the conflict between men and women, the conflict between whites and blacks and people of different cultures and of different skin colors. This question of privilege, who has privilege and who doesn't have it. And there is this experience that people who have privilege can never understand you, can never listen to you, can never give you anything unless they stand to benefit from it. And the fact that you try uh, to think about it, that this is why a lot of concepts have started to emerge, like uh, mansplaining and all kinds of similar trends, you know, where it's basically that you can't 
have a reasonable discussion with a man or a white man even worse because white men don't listen to you and white men will only hear what they want to hear and white men will always uh, try to use language to oppress you and to make themselves feel superior. Once again, we're back to this question of superiority. And uh, what we find here is a feeling of inferiority. A feeling that I, uh, along a lot of people, that they feel inferior to other people. And you know, the thing that, that's so difficult about the inferiority complex and feeling inferior is that feeling inferior tends to make us feel alienated and cut off. A person that feels inferior will often seek to hide the fact that they are inferior, will often seek to cover up to or ignore or avoid the question of feeling inferior. And in this, uh, there is a tendency among inferior people to avoid anything associated with success or with white culture, or with male culture, or with male ideals. And the tendency to want to purge everything that will remind you of this negative feeling, this feeling of not being as good or of not being as successful or of not having achieved as much. So the question is, should we participate in the structures or should we avoid them? And what I ask myself when I study postmodernism is, why does postmodernism emerge? What made us lose faith in institutions? What made us lose faith in identity, in science, in categories, in language? What caused it to happen? Because, you know, up until the 1970s, you could argue, at least scientifically and statistically, that we were heading towards increased equality. And uh, we can see even globally that poverty rates are decreasing. And you can see, in a sense, that things are getting better. You know, people are rising out of poverty. Uh, and uh, a lot of things are getting better for uh, women across the globe, for black people across the world. There are some backwards trends like incarceration rates in the US and uh, some things that uh, go in the wrong direction. But overall, scientists seem to think that we are all doing pretty well. <laughs> overall, we're improving. Overall, things are getting better. At the same time, yes, you can argue that the wealth difference has increased. While poor people are richer than ever, rich people are also richer than ever. And rich people have gotten a lot richer, while poor people have only gotten a little bit richer. So, in, a in average, there is, of course, some merit to the feeling if you compare yourself to others, things are going in the wrong direction. If you want equality or some kind of equal condition, then things are not good. And, you know, this is where socialism integrates with postmodernism. You don't have to be a socialist to be a postmodernist, but... A lot of socialists are attracted to the idea of postmodernism, especially if they have lost faith in uh, uh, the traditional ideas of achieving socialism and of achieving equality. If you stopped to believe that communism was a viable option, if you didn't think that uh, you could build socialism through social democratic parties or organization and unions or hard work or collaboration, then postmodernism become, became this idea. And you know, postmodernism isn't a philosophy in the sense that it's a suggestion of how we should live. It is a critique. It's only a critique. It's a critique of what we used to do, but it is not a suggestion of what we should do now. And the question of what we should do now, that's something postmodernism don't want to answer and don't know how to answer <laughs> or don't try to answer. If pessimism has gotten so deep that you believe there is no solution at all. And I believe like the biggest reason for postmodernism and the biggest critique is uh, this uh, massive climate anxiety, this massive environmental anxiety. I believe there is a massive environmental anxiety all throughout the globe. I believe that people all over the globe are affected by news of climate change and by this notion that we are all possibly going to die or we're all possibly going to suffer or the world is going to end or something bad is going to happen. You know, when people feel that they are going to die or when people become worried of the possibility of death or of loss of security or loss of stability, they become very, very selfish. Often, uh, 
selfish political parties have only won votes on basically pushing an agenda of things are getting worse. Uh, notice that some parties are more about selling a message that things are getting worse. Notice that some parties benefit. You know, if you tell everyone that things are going to hell and nothing is working and society is collapsing, then notice what people do. You know, people flock to these parties in these situations uh, because uh, similarly to how we flock to lifeboats, because we see them as kind of an exit strategy. You know, when things are in panic and we feel that we are going to die, we all have this mentality of trying to save our own lives, often at the expense of others, save our own position, save our own identity, save what we have. And uh, in this, I feel like we are almost all just verifying ourselves and our own position, and we are all... Uh, kind of cutting off our own empathy and ability to empathize with other people. We are cutting off our ability to understand others, to reason with others, and we are cutting out the roots of our very democracy, you know. At the, some point, if these ideas become big enough, democracy is impossible. Uh, there is no room for it. There is no uh, basis for it. Uh, if you don't believe, if you're too pessimistic to believe politicians can do anything, that politics will ever work, that uh, things will ever get better, that change is ever possible, well, then you generally are more inclined to either not vote at all and in this let other people vote, and in this the people that do vote will vote for people that have almost fascist ideas. And that's just kind of a trend in the Western world. Less people are voting, and the people that are voting are more likely to vote for fascist ideals and principles. And perhaps it's kind of like a desire to hold on to what's left. Society is falling apart, science is falling apart. What are the things we can hold on to? What are the things we can cling to? Is it perhaps nationality? Is it perhaps... Uh, uh, our wealth, or the things we have built up, what can we save? What are the things I want to save? And uh, then we look at what we have, and then we look at who will protect it, and then we look at who seems uh, to share it, and uh, we kind of band together in that sense. Of the, it's, uh, it becomes just the survival of the fittest. And, you know, democracy hinges on the ability that we believe that we can make things better. If people don't believe things will get better, if they don't see a future, you know, psychologists have analyzed this on the basis of violence. Why do we engage in violence and war and conflict? And uh, one of the strongest ideas is sold by Steven Pinker. It basically states this one thing. Violence exists because people don't perceive themselves as having a future. We engage in conflicts and we risk our own life to kill other people or to engage in conflicts uh, because we don't think about getting a college degree or getting a job or the American dream or having a house or a family. We don't think about it anymore. We've given up in that sense or we never even thought about it to begin with. That makes people do stupid things. This lack of a future makes people do stupid things. And uh, postmodernism is at the center of this and it's not a philosophy, it's not an answer and that's why Postmodernism is so hated because it's not an answer. Uh, perhaps something did need to change after modernism. Perhaps some of our strategies didn't work. Perhaps there were some issues. I don't believe it was completely bad. I believe we built so many good things during the modernist era. We built so many foundations. People got happier. People felt better. People had more safety. People, <laughs> The world did change for the better during the modernist ages. And... Uh, so, if everything didn't possibly go the way we wanted it to, what were the things that we did wrong? And what were the things we could have done better? What kind of philosophy could we cling to after modernism or postmodernism that is an actual answer to how we should live, how we should treat one another, and how we should, what we should fundamentally aim for in society? And I believe it centers around one core thing, and that is the verification of humanity. We should build society, we should build a society based on human interests, on psychology, and what we know about human beings, and what we want, and what we value, and what we find important. 
anything people can conceptualize as an important thing, such as kindness or ambition or progress or status, is something society should provide or give an opportunity to get, give. Now, all those things are things that we should talk about and discuss. We should talk about what we want and what we need, and we should create structures and societies and things that give these things. Perhaps the problem with modernism was one thing, and that it was the hyper-focus on labor and the belief that labor would solve everything. Perhaps labor was the thing that wasn't making us happier and, anymore. Perhaps materialism was, was, was what wasn't giving us happiness anymore. Perhaps that was the problem, or clinging to work and to a materialism and to power games. And perhaps we can find a way to live better without these things, or with more moderation and with more support for other values alongside these values, such as having time for family and friendship, or of being kind and doing something good for the world, or of learning and philosophy, or <laughs> search of new opportunities, or the discovery of new space rockets, or the ability to go to new planets, or the ability to invent new great inventions, AI, I don't know. Perhaps that is the answer to postmodernism. And I do have one thought of hope, and that is postmodernism is not the next logical step after modernism. Sometimes people think it is, but it is not. It's more like a regression. It's more like a loss of faith in what we had than a newfound faith in what came after. It's not that we have started to verify uh, the environment or that we've started to realize more important things that we needed more than modern modernism. It is that we have started to doubt and question and get angry and frustrated with what modernism can provide. So modernism is more like, uh, postmodernism is more like the frustration and anxiety that people feel in the modernist uh, and with the modernist era and with what it did. And uh, we need to move from that frustration towards actual real solutions towards how we can build a better society. Verifying science once again, verifying reason and verifying the ability to think and to be intelligent and to be pragmatic and to be kind and to be considerate and to be helpful and to be honest, to be modest, to be a good person. So perhaps... The next pursuit and the next uh, academic that I will hail or the next person that I'll fall in love with uh, from a purely philosophical standpoint is the kind of person that will offer a solution, a meaningful solution to what should come after modernism. And it cannot be in postmodernism because postmodernism is pessimistic, it is skeptical, it is contrarian, it is hostile, it is a kind of bitter surrendering in uh, it's a kind of frustration that is starting to spread all over society and is starting to really cut out our ability to empathize and to connect and to live together no matter who we are no matter what identity we subscribe to no matter what part of society we feel a part of so Please get on that. Thank you for watching this video and I hope to see you in the next one.